jobs, it should be a livable wage. It's the poorest neighborhoods that live next to the highest environmental hazards. Mothers and families living in conditions of perennial destitution. Are we ready to end poverty in California? It's like really hard when your kids are hungry. We drove there, my fucking car ran out of gas, going to the food bank with all the kids in the car. And we had to walk home with no food. There's a liquor store right there, though. There's a liquor store, another one right there you can see. And then this place also sells a bunch of liquor. I don't I don't know, understand the need for three liquor stores so close. I feel like me being poor and me being a poor person in a poor neighborhood, I'm not gonna be heard. If you're spending more time at galas and chicken dinners than you are walking the neighborhood, then you're doing this job wrong. You can't really talk about poverty from on high. You have to really get down with the folks. How politics is, is, is ran in California, it's gonna have to change eventually. It's just gonna have to, somebody's gonna have to spark that change. So, uh, and I just hope I can be that, that, that spark to that match. A lot of people are now looking at Stockton, California. There's a new mayor here, Michael Tubbs. Just 26 when he was elected. Stockton, California is where, roughly near Sacramento? It's between Sacramento and San Francisco. It's the 12th largest city in the state, about 300,000 people. 300,000 people? 323,000 people. You're in charge of that. With other people helping, for sure. Yes, of course. <laughs> it's just this month we announced a $20 million scholarship program, so now that every kid in our school district could go to school essentially tuition free. If you grew up in a community with all the inputs, you had good schools, had grocery stores, had banks, had clean streets, then of course your, your, your response to this is like, this is not real, this is not my America. But for far too many people in this country, particularly people of color in this country, that's not the reality. They grow up in neighborhoods like the ones I grew up in, where the only time- Epic or ending poverty in California is incredibly personal for me. Uh, before I was a mayor, before I was a special advisor, before all of this, I was a young black kid in Stockton, California, um, in poverty. My mom, she was 16 when she was pregnant with me. Uh, my father was incarcerated then and has been incarcerated most of the last 32 years. I went to Franklin High School, a large school that was once deemed a dropout factory. And luckily at Franklin, there was an international baccalaureate program, a magnet program in a public school, which allowed me to take rigorous college preparatory classes. And because of that preparation and due to a lot of help and support from my family and others, I was able to go to Stanford and get my bachelor's and master's degree from there. My mother worked incredibly hard to just barely make it. When we talk about predatory lending and insufficient housing um, and high rents and et cetera, those are all things I, I, I feel viscerally. A big point of confusion for me was how poverty was almost never really explicitly talked about outside of like poverty, anti-poverty advocates. We talk about housing insecurity, we talk about homelessness, we talk about crime, we talk about the middle class, and politicians give speeches all the time and no one talks about poverty. I spend some time thinking like it needs to be that an organizing effort that spoke to elected leaders and used the traditional levers of government, and then you see that with our select committee and the way we engage a speaker and other, the governor, my role with the governor, et cetera, around telling a new story about poverty and how we ended up here. Um, and that's sort of how Epic was born. This listening session is with the Young Women's Freedom Center. They're an amazing organization of women who have been impacted by the system and are thinking about not just poverty, but in criminal justice and safety, but really about how do we create a society where everyone's basic needs are met. Why do we waste time continuing to put money to take kids out of the system and put them in somebody else's home, put them into a group home, put them into a place where if anybody's been following the news for the last 15 years, we are hearing don't work. Because all that money going into government services, that's what we keep saying, could go to the communities and we wouldn't need those services. But let's talk about being incarcerated, working, making seven cents an hour, and then them taking 55% of my money every month. So what does that give me? Nothing. So what does that happen to my children? They suffer. Now they're in poverty. 
right? I think that the, the work of sister warriors is we can't end incarceration or the criminalization of, of folks if we don't have economic opportunities. We know that having resources allows people to make self-determined choice on what they want for their families. Sister Warriors is a powerful group of women, girls, trans, gender expansive folks in California who've been directly impacted by incarceration, violence, poverty. And I do this work because I know that the experience that I had um, is what we need for all of these folks who haven't had opportunities to be able to realize their own power so that we could build enough people power to transform our state. You should do a black background with like pink, like mesh with little squiggles, different colors. Mm. That oh always reminds God. me of 80. So I was incarcerated the first time when I was 13. I mean, literally the day my sister died, I was incarcerated. They opened the door, they told me and shut the door. It was a lot of trauma that I was dealing with, you know? Um, sexual trauma, the trauma of my sister dying, like my, just so much. And what I needed was like love and support and that can't happen inside of cement walls. But really um, being incarcerated as a child really um, impacted me. No. Yes, uh, <laughs> well, so I I wanna let mine do mine, hell no. Excuse my language, sorry. Why'd you say that? <laughs> when we first met, I was getting out of prison myself, you know, going through things, you know, being in the streets. And we kind of took to each other and kind of bonded over that because she was going through the same thing I was going through, but on a female level and I was on a man level. So, you know, we kind of stuck with it and we talked a lot you know, before we became boyfriend and girlfriend. I seen him and he wasn't saying nothing. he got in the car, but so then I called his cousin when I left. I was like, who is that guy? He said, that's my cousin. <laughs> then he put him on the phone. I didn't know he was gonna do that. So yeah, <laughs> he likes to take the glory for our relationship. <laughs> <laughs> I drove around most of my adult life with my children with no tags, no car insurance. And so when I'd go to DMV, it's like uh, license revoked, license revoked, license revoked. Uh, I knew which back streets to take, but things like the kind of a debt, the kind of debt you accrue in poverty um, with no access to capital or credit keeps you in this kind of perpetual state of poverty. Um, you know, I have tags on my car now and my bills are generally paid automatically, right? One of the most like, hardest days that I, I remember is that, um, I mean, we didn't have any food. And we were like, it's like really hard when your kids are hungry. And I didn't have no gas, no tags. <laughs> like, but I knew there was this church down the street. We used to live in, in Oakland for a long time and they, they, they would give food and sometimes they'd even give chickens. And we drove there, my fucking car, ran out of gas, going to the food bank with all the kids in the car. And we had to walk home with no food. And so I think like, those are all things my kids experienced with me, being in the homeless shelters, like me, you know, they didn't know where I was, but I'd be all day at the welfare office, you know, watching 1980s videos of how to get a job by matching blue eyeshadow to your blouse. <laughs> As a kid, I was hella curious and was like, wait, what, what is this? Or, you know, I'm sure I gave my mom a hard time. I'm like, why are we doing this? Why not doing this? See, and and um, as I got older, I was like, oh, that's our experiences shape our perspectives. And then you have kids and then, <laughs> and then we're growing up. And so, and so it was really just like a context to my life so I could better understand it. I was in my role as executive director for six years. Um, I, I came into that role, you know, living on Section 8. My rent was set to zero. My income was uh, welfare. And, you know, over the course of the past six years, while I've been working 70 hours a week, I've also been able to earn more than I've ever earned. And it's been the thing that's transformed, like, really my life. The implications of long-term poverty is that I don't have credit. I mean, I have bad credit that's followed me and I haven't made enough yet 
where I can pay my bills and pay down my back debt. I still owe food stamps, right? So I have all of these things that have followed me, old court fees. You know, it's like I'm 43, my children are in school, um, and their whole lives I was in poverty. And so um, even things like understanding how much taxes are taken out of my check. I'm like, wait, I'm not getting a return? And the other thing that isn't talked about is that the emotional weight of being in poverty, like you always have stress, you know? You're never not stressed. Talent and in intellect are distributed broadly, but resources, opportunities are not. And while entering in the White House, my cousin was murdered in Stockton, and it was really that sort of murder that made me think about what would it mean to come home and think about if, if it is truly a policy issue, what are the state, what are the types of policies that should be enacted to create communities where young people have the chance not just to live, not just to survive, but to thrive, where young people have the same sense of agency, the same sense of purpose, the same sense of somebodyness that I saw from everybody I went to college with. So we started today with um, a group of black men who, are, who lead different initiatives in Fresno. It's like, well, like economic mobility. And then we spent some time with the school district, really thinking about sort of how can the school be an engine of anti-poverty efforts. And now we're gonna end the day with a conversation with the community. It ain't like we ain't been fighting to tell them what we've been needing all these years. It's just a matter that they ain't did. That's the first thing I ask, what is you doing for us? When you go to get help, they, they give you all these, this paper with resources that are available to you, and they just send you on your way. And then when you go to an interview, you don't qualify because you don't have this or document, or you don't have this, or you're not this, or whatever. There's people that work in the fields, and, you know, they keep on working and working, and it's just like, you know, they're pretty much living just to die, you know? My mom, she's one of them. I'm tired of asking for help to people in higher position than me. For what? For them to just, oh, we're gonna handle it, but they never get back to us. I always speak my mind, and a lot of my frustration did come out at that meeting. I was there more to kind of give a little bit of my insight of what Fresno looks like on our end. My name is Paloma Sanchez, and I'm a stay-at-home mom. Look, mom has a book. You want to read? Uh-huh. I have a, a three-year-old, and that's kind of just been my mission, and it will always be my mission. I want to leave this place a better place for her. Wow, look at Who's that? Paw Patrol making a Christmas tree. Is Paw Patrol making a Christmas tree? Uh-huh. I'm undocumented. I'm an undocumented mother at that, and I feel like there's not very many resources out here for me as that alone. So just the fact that I have a little one that is documented, I'm going to make sure she gets whatever she can. I want to go into the medical field. I want to be a forensic doctor. I want to I wanna do things. <laughs> Sky some open plumbing? Yeah, they're decorating the Christmas tree. They're not this. Yeah. It, it kind of bothered me in the aspect that we've been speaking, but we just don't get heard. It takes for somebody else from somebody else's town to come. We try to speak, like, for fundings. We try to speak for jobs, um, like, for the kids, for the parks, for the schools. Like, things that us as a community feel that we need here in Fresno. And I feel like things that have to do with the things that we kind of push the issue on, they kind of just get shushed away rather mm -hmm. than, you know, a spotlight put on it. It's a flying cow. It's a flying cow? Wow, that's so cool. What's that? How is it got a cow? How is it flying? I don't know. Honestly, um, I've been going to like city hall events and like little events like that, that event, similar event, since I was, I want to say, 15, 16. It's a, it's a thing in me that just makes me want to like, hey, like, you're going to listen to me. Like, I live here. You can't tell me what I need if you don't live here. I've lost a lot of hope 
But regardless of the hope that I've lost, I'm still going to keep on pushing. I'm going to keep on pushing for my parks. I'm going to keep on pushing for my community. I'm going to keep on pushing for speed bumps in neighborhoods that need speed bumps. I got to tell you, I'm really tired of being an advocate. I really wish we had some policy help so that we don't have to work as hard in the advocacy space. And just for us to start thinking holistically about things. If, if we had universal health care, that would free you up to advance in a career. You don't have to, you don't have that concern. A lot of us is not hip to the historic ways of oppressing us, especially on the Southwest side, like the red lighting and eminent domain. It's not really talked about too much within the community, so they don't know why or understand why this side of town is not prospering to our northern neighbor. My name is Keyshawn White, and we are in Fresno, California, uh, specifically the southwest side of Fresno, California. One, two, ready, go. I love just the rhythm, the beat, and just the connection that I, that I have with, uh, with the drums. I try to tackle uh, and combat the, the pretty much the oppression of environmental racism within Fresno, and, and that kind of can line up with, uh, with the poverty, because in a sense of poverty is, I feel like, is when your city pretty much let a specific area within your city kind of down and, and just completely forget about them and kind of shut them out from all the resources that the other sides, parts of the city is providing. My name is Marcel Woodruff. I am the director of the Community Justice Network. Keyshawn was that, that kid who was just designated for poverty, right? He was being conditioned to live in permanent poverty for the, for the rest of his life. And so he would go to school or go be in certain spaces and he would always be the kid that you bounced out, right? And so I think with Keyshawn, like the quirkiness is, you know, it was this kid who was just his own kid, but the system around him had already had plans for him and categorized him. But community came alongside of him and said, no, nah, we're gonna love this kid no matter what happens, you know, through and through. And then he lands on the other side and it's like, nobody would have ever imagined that Keyshawn would be where he is and he's still there and he's going higher. One one issue that kind of stuck to me was air quality. I kind of wanted to understand why was a lot of kids within my neighborhood suffering from like asthma and bronchitis at like like alarming rates, like, you know, kind of like the whole class got inhalers. So that kind of always sparked a question in my head. Um, then that kind of forced me to find my lane in social justice of uh, ENJ and environmental justice, especially of our environmental racism within the southwest side of Fresno. Um, so from that, uh, I applied for a grant, uh, a small mini grant of $1,000. That With that grant, I was able to purchase an air quality monitor, a drone. So what I did, I cut Fresno into four quadrants, and I just randomly identified five schools, and each quadrant was a total of 20 schools. Through that process, after I was done, I found out that the northeast side, and compared to this side, is three times better. And now the whole northern side compared to the south side is four times better. So, and with that, I just felt like no one, no one knew. To be honest, this is really my mentor right here. Everything about the air quality uh, management, I just be like, just looking up to him, uh, like asking him questions, trying to learn new things every day. Yeah, I always see him doing something big with himself, you know? And then when he brought us around here to do the little air quality ma management, you know, I always like, like, you follow behind him, you know? My biggest thing was to get this information, gather my data, and equip the community with this information and have them take that information and use it to their advantage. I didn't know how big my project was gonna get when I first came up with the idea, but my, Marcel told me that was that's a million dollar idea right there. I'm 16, I, I can't grasp that. Uh, I'm just trying to do something like this, just to stay busy, you know, and to be involved. With the kids I've worked with, all of them are, they're all unique in their own special way, right? They all have different gifts, but it's really the ones that are empowered to just show up unapologetically and be themselves and just learn how to, or just well, embrace in, in community and in deep relationships. Those are the ones that, that, that change the world. Of course I'm proud when people want to talk about my accomplishments. Everyone wants to be called exceptional. Everyone wants people to be proud of the work they put in. But here's what I also know. What's unique about my story is that I'm not exceptional at all. I'm normal. I started Epic because we need a narrative different from the exceptional individual overcoming insurmountable obstacles and odds. That we need a more truthful story, a story that ends poverty in California. It's a story that really takes on what I call the setup, the systems, the policies, and the institutions that perpetuate and sustain poverty. Why 
why is the requirement that you already have to have made it to a certain point hmm. to be able to get to the next level? I mean, if we're really trying to get people out of poverty, don't we have to start serving people in poverty? Trying to obtain business credit without using having to use your own credit. So your credit scores are so low that to get any type of business credit. We need to consider um, historical uh, inequalities as well and having direct programs for specific populations. I think I received an email and it sounded like a really interesting dialogue that was happening about um, the importance of entrepreneurship to you know, people of color and small businesses, and that's what brought us there. Um, my name is Yasmeen Muktasid. And I am Michael Darwin. We're actually at Omnific Studios, and this is our design studio. Well, this is one of the jackets I did for Prince for the 3121 World Tour. There's only 52 made in the world. My favorites in living color that started the whole thing off making jackets. This is one of the original and living color jackets. When everything just shut down, like totally shut down, you know, we were listening for what are the needs for the country right now. So all these opportunities start popping up. So I told Yasmin, hey, let's put together uh, maybe some type of offering to the hospitals and send it out. And we sent it out and then we got responses and then we ended up making um, gowns, masks. So that was, I mean, other businesses were saying, oh, we're losing money in the pandemic. But we were saying, not us. It was just being creative, I think, and tapping into um, the resources. And even here in the City of Commerce, like with our local assembly person, assembly um, you know, yeah. doing some masks for the community, for community members who couldn't really afford masks. But mm -hmm. remember at that time, it was like people were using socks to make masks. Like there was, you know, a deficiency, there wasn't enough. It was more a season of struggle that I experienced um, more than once growing up, sometimes having to move a lot, you know, being evicted sometimes. Um, but then also I went to UCLA. As a kid, I mean, I can only remember, we were always provided for because we had a, also a network of uh, relatives. Our grandmother, you know, was one of the foundations of our family. So my father, when he was away in military, we were pretty well taken care of um, all the time. When uh, my dad got his GI Bill and he began to buy real estate. And from that point on, uh, my parents like did very well. As I come down downtown LA and you see the poverty slapping you in the face, uh, you know, under the bridges, you know, walking on the streets, people living in tents, you know, it's abominable. But if, that, if each one of those people had an opportunity to be able to expand their gifts, the opportunity for uh, education, opportunity for schooling, opportunity for networking, opportunity to um, reach out and actually have a concrete system in place, not just words, not just, you know, political verbiage, you know, it, it, the whole world would be a completely different place. I think if there are ways that there can be targeted you know, encouragement, particularly I think for um, African Americans in this country and directed policy, I think, to help young um, black girls and boys to channel that creativity and those gifts at a young age. Like, if you don't like doing this, but you like doing this, how can you bring that to the world? Take impossibility off the table and know that it's possible no matter where you start because I probably shouldn't be here by all, you know, by all standards. I have never talked about poverty and mm. certainly never talked about my poverty growing up and never ever thinking about starting a business or mm. employing people. I just, it just never came to my mind. Mm. I am Hilda Kennedy and I am founder and president of Ampac Business Capital and we finance and foster business success from cradle to legacy, helping businesses to get capital to grow, expand, and scale. So Ampac has done a little over a billion dollars. We hit a billion dollar mark this year in loans for small businesses. The need is there and we're growing. I'm solving a pain. The pain for me is a lot of people can't get access to traditional capital. 
And so if I can do that, that's exciting to me because I've been able to say yes to someone who has said everyone else has said no to. I've been here for like 20, 30 minutes. I love talking about my family. I'm really grateful for my family. I've been married 27 years to the incredible Brian Kennedy Sr., who is a senior pastor of a church. He's been pastoring there for 23 years. He's the love of my life. And I said 27, and it's 28 years now. <laughs> oh, gosh. Actually, it's 29 years. That's terrible. <laughs> it's 29. We found out how much we could do with Growing them. up in a home full of love, but limited resources, in living in South Central Los Angeles, quite honestly, I was, um, this is not true for all of my siblings, but I was, I did not feel safe in my neighborhood. I didn't know until later, just going to college with, probably middle-class families, middle-class um, minority families, how much we, we just didn't have or were not exposed to. My mom died at 55. She showed me hard work, and she sacrificed a lot for us, a whole lot. It's just very different from my children's experience. What I've learned, what I've experienced, what I see with the people that we serve, there is no doing it yourself. <laughs> Everybody needs somebody. You need a customer. <laughs> you need someone to um, believe in you. You need someone to write a check. You, everybody needs somebody. And I know where I came from. That's why I work the way I work. And I think about other people and second chances because I've had a gazillion chances. And I think I've been called to this work because of my humble background. I really do. We didn't order, we couldn't order drinks. <laughs> Look at the numbers. Over the last 10 years, less than 10% of SBA 504 loans, that's the program, have gone to Latino-owned businesses to own commercial real estate. But for African-American-owned businesses, less than 2% have gone to those business owners. And yet they're growing at rates north of 30% pre-pandemic. So what's the barrier to entry? It's down payment. I remember being so inspired at how so many folks wanted to start small businesses. And not just to make money for themselves, but to make money for their community, to create jobs for their community, to solve a real need in their community. And how there's a huge issues with lack of access to information, access to capital, et cetera. It's about sort of troubling the narrative that it's not about sort of one individual's effort and, and, and motivation because there's a lot of motivated, hardworking people that are poor. It's not about one sort of financial acumen because there's a lot of people without money who could manage money. They just don't have money to manage. But, but it's really about how do we remove the barriers, remove the obstacles, remedy the policies, make up for what hasn't been done, and watch what happens. And you'll see like real competition. You'll see real meritocracy. And you'll see like the potential of so many people that have just been forgotten, marginalized, and, and left behind, despite still contributing to our sort of statewide and national story. So it's like the, the leasing office is like, hey, you need to pay this. And they're given like three day notice. Wow. On that um, bill that is due, like you need to pay this in three days or move on top of the rent that's coming up. Uh, yeah. And that's what's happening to me. I never understood when they say like the low income apartments and things like that. How low is low for you? Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, you know, how old yeah. what is low? Unfortunately, like in my case, my kids say, sorry, mommy, no grandkids. <laughs> no grandkids because we can't even afford ourselves. Mm. Yeah, uh, yesterday, ayer, I was in an apartment complex 
No, my son, that's apartamentos, it's just in those apartment complexes. There was 18 evictions happening. So I'm with an organization called Monument Impact, one of the hosts that helped put this together. I'm also an Antioch resident, right? So I, I drive around, I see the stuff that's happening. I go to the apartment complexes, I, I hear what's happening. My name's Jose Cordon, I'm a poet and community organizer. One of my favorite things about Antioch is the water, how close you can get, and then just the access to nature. You'll hear things like, um, you know, Antioch is not what it used to be. You know, things like, you know, Antioch is going to going to shit, excuse my language. Right? You'll hear things like, um, you know, this city is gonna become the next Antioch, you know, essentially using Antioch as like the the negative you know, negative part of the analogy. We bounced around a lot growing up, definitely. Um, to the point, where I think when I was like in ninth grade, I was already like in eight different schools or something like that. Or like, so, so a lot, a lot of movement. I think a lot of that was, um, was just parents trying to find um, different situations for us as their kids. You know, different job opportunities. Um, definitely, there was a point in time where Antioch was the place that folks came to, to essentially get away from cities, to become like a safer place that was affordable. And that was all happening during the time when they were giving away those, those uh, messed up loans. When I was a sophomore, a teacher of mine called Mr. Omar, he gave me a book, and that book was called Pedagogy of the Oppressed. It's about accessibility to education and reading and language and stuff like that, and it's a very hard book to read. Along that journey, I came across an organization called One Day at a Time. It's a youth leadership development program. Through that organization, I got to do a lot of community work and, and different types of stuff. From meeting Dolores Huerta, Regeburta Menchu, to, uh, you know, organizing a Brown Paper Youth Conference. So a bunch of stuff that I got to do through that organization, that's how I got to go to Northern Ireland. And so I discovered a love uh, for serving community. And then it was through that organization that I really started to serve community and do community work. So really what we're trying to do is, is, is try to find the commonalities here and, and, and make the point that this is not a single individualized issue. This is an apartment-wide issue, and so it takes large solutions. It doesn't, it, one individual can't do it. It takes the entire management, the owners, the residents, everybody to come together and address it. So that's what we're trying to do, find what's going on. If more than one person is happening, okay, two people, three people, four people, five, six, now 100 out of the 200 people, are like you have an issue. That's what we want to identify. And then really the main core is to be able to empower the residents of any apartment complex to organize themselves. Well, we don't have to, do, we, maybe we start it, but we don't finish it. And then when something happens, like a crazy amount of evictions, crazy amount of rent increases, they are able to organize themselves, rise up and negotiate as a collective against those that have power as the owners. Wait, nine, Should be that one down there. Hey, Hi, how you guys. doing? Hey. Good, good, good. Just came to talk Let's to you again. I okay. told you we'll come by real quick. So far in this row, that person has got an eviction notice, they're gone. This house has an eviction notice, they're gone. This person got an eviction notice, they're gone. And they all got served. So these are all openings. You can still see the tissue left on the oh. floor right here around. Our pipes are all connected to the pipes behind us, so we share one line. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when I come home from work, um, you know, it could be feces right here, human shit. So if theirs gets clogged, it comes out from here, from yeah. the bottom. It was originally low income uh, place, so people were coming in eight, $800, kind of what I'm paying. Um, but it's like 1800 now. The reality here, because it's, People want a way to survive, and it's just, it's hard. You know, a lot, a lot of these folks, you know, Antioch is like what they call like a, a sleep town or whatever that is, like, like a sleeper town or whatever, where people come here to sleep a lot, you know? And in order to get out, you need cars, and so sometimes they don't have cars, and sometimes you do have a car, but your job doesn't pay that much, you're paying rent, and then your car goes out, you don't have the money to pay for the car. Now the bus, the, the, the transportation here isn't the best out here in this area, the infrastructure for it. You know, so it's, it's easy to get down on your luck, um, but this area needs a lot of help. There are 800 evictions in the pipeline in East County alone. And this is East County? This is East County. It, it goes from like, say, maybe Bay Point, but Pittsburgh all the way east past Oakley, Brentwood. Carter. I think there's a trajectory um, of good. Um, like I think the one we did in Antioch was good, 
because I learned a lot <laughs> about Antioch. I had no idea it was the eviction capital of the Bay Area, just none, right? Learned a lot about the local politics in Antioch. We learned that there was a council meeting the next week. I think it would have been even better if we had known that before. We got, got there a little bit earlier. Like There's could, things we could have been done to really build for power for that council meeting. So yeah, I think good is first doing it is good. Um, I think better is sort of a concrete action that comes about of it or comes out of it or an ability to steer people and that energy to something. And then sort of following back and making sure people know sort of the policy recommendation or the policy change that's been tied to their work or what they share, their time. Yeah, one of the good things about the tour was that there was an inflection point we could point people towards, even if it wasn't a destination. And that inflection point was the launch of our select committee on ending poverty in California. I'm Isaac Bryan, and I'm the state assembly member for the 55th Assembly District. I've lived in this district uh, as long as I've lived in LA, which is longer than anywhere in my whole life. The 55th District is, is a unique district in all of California because it has extreme affluence. I'm talking West Los Angeles affluence, Miracle Mile affluence, and kind of deep poverty. Uh, the Crenshaw Corridor, the Merck Park. Um, it also has affluence that ranges, uh, that crosses race intersectionally. View Park, Baldwin Hills, some of the most affluent black communities. And so I see it largely as my job to try to bridge these communities and to find ways that we can um, uplift the conditions of life for everybody, move people out of poverty and into economic opportunity and kind of build the kind of community examples where they didn't exist previously. Sanctuary Hope is one of those community-based organizations in the neighborhood uh, that serves false youth, transition age youth, um, youth who are unhoused or on the brink of being unhoused. And it's, it's one of those special places where I like to come by, see the young people, see the services they're being connected to, and talk about the ways that uh, we can collaborate better to fill some of the gaps that people are still falling through. Here within his district, we have the second highest population of foster youth, the second highest population of young people experiencing a, a, a housing crisis. And we definitely have poverty, especially for many of the young people who come through these doors um, looking to have their basic needs met. It's important to me personally because uh, I was adopted as a kid along with eight others. I was born to a teenage mother. Um, she survived an attack. Uh, she got pregnant from that attack. She, she couldn't keep me. Uh, substance abuse was uh, prevalent in the household. In fact, she wasn't living with either of her biological parents while she was carrying me because there wasn't um, a safe place for her to be at that particular moment. Um, gave me up at birth. Um, not long after that, I was the foster child of the Bryan family, adopted by the Bryan family. They had four biological children of their own, ultimately adopted nine of us. We came out to California, and as a number of us got older, we got to see the ways that kind of the past traumas that had brought us to the Bryan family um, were not all alleviated and appeared in the education system. I failed out of middle school. Uh, I have siblings who didn't graduate high school. Um, they showed up in contact with the criminal legal system. There are a number of people in my family who have been to jail or incarcerated. I have a sibling who's incarcerated right now. Um, so for me to have made it to UCLA for my master's in public policy, it was definitely uh, an aberration from what was expected. Um, there were times when I could have slipped uh, easily, uh, and there were many people around me who refused to let me fall on my own. You could become, I would say, in poverty in many different ways. That don't have nothing to do with just being a foster care. Right. You can be unhoused when your family give up on you. A lot of youth who um, deal with a lot of trauma with family and with being on the streets, and it's, it's good to have people that care. I see the role that Miss Kelly and Sanctuary Hope fills is because the government hasn't done enough, <laughs> right? Like, she shouldn't be helping you get off the streets if we didn't let you fall into being on the streets to begin with. So whatever we can do to alleviate those gaps in the child welfare system as it pertains to deep poverty and economic opportunity um, is, is something I want to work on. And so coming to places like Sanctuary Hope keeps me grounded. Um, keeps me rooted in the everyday struggle that our young people feel 
Uh, and it's, it's something that uh, I was doing before I was in office. And I think you need to go back to the places that you used to go before you were elected official when you become an elected official. So this is one of those places. <laughs> Michael Tubbs has been my friend for a long time, since before I was in office. In fact, he was one of the first endorsers. He was building out Epic and Poverty in California and wanted to connect that work more directly to policy implementation, right? And, and our state budget, making sure that our budget matched our values and that centering poverty or the alleviation of poverty would be a core value. And I remember very clearly, we were having dinner one night. It was me, him, and Speaker Anthony Rendon. Uh, and Michael Tubbs said, you know, how do I get a select committee to focus on these issues? And Speaker Rendon said, you ask Assemblymember Brian to write me a letter. And the next day I wrote him a letter. <laughs> this is something for the people who are most impacted to have an intimate role in shaping the work of the select committee, the focus of the select committee, uh, and, and the purpose of the select committee. And that's when we decided uh, to throw the rally uh, and throw the kickoff in that way. We're not asking for anything crazy. We're not asking for anything radical. We're not asking for anything more than what is our God-given right, which is to be able to live in this golden state with dignity. Because, because it's, it's a fight. fight. And when my brother Michael Tubbs hit me up and he said, look, we need a vehicle in the state legislator to talk about these issues. We're talking about everything except the one thing that connects every struggle across our state, and that's poverty. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Monica Lasso. I'm a single mother. I'm here to say that we've had enough. I say to you on behalf of 750,000 members and Fight for 15 members and other folks that want to join our union, we stand with you. This analysis of looking at poverty has to be done in a real way through the lived experiences of those who face that poverty. Because when we fight, we when we fight, Thank you very much. And the next part is probably the most important part where we translate these words, these sentiments, these platitudes into policy. Welcome to the inaugural uh, first hearing of the Select Committee on Poverty uh, and Economic Inclusion. There's a set of rules that I'm supposed to enforce that make this space a dignified space. And those rules weren't made for the community. Those rules weren't made for a community that's been unheard in that building, unseen in that building, unwelcome in that building. And so on that day, we decided to break those rules. There's, there's a decorum in these hearing rooms uh, that you're not supposed to snap or clap or whoop whoop. But today, this is my hearing room. And it's your hearing room. So you're free to do all of that. What we have the unique opportunity to do in California is to upset that with common sense, well-researched policies from baby bonds to guaranteed income to housing as a right to, to more affordable housing to truly make the state a, a, a golden one for all. These baby bonds are one of the best policy tools at our disposal to combat the enduring effects of our history and chart a better path forward. We ask the governor to include higher wages for providers in the budget. Increasing access to health care and food assistance for undocumented Californians. Sadly, most small businesses can't afford to provide health care. Um, I know there's a program called CalSavers, but you have to have five or more employees. Why can't it be less? You cannot police poverty, uh, especially when it comes to housing. And for a person like me in this campaign that go out to bear witness to other people, uh, because I do basic needs and I go out to the encampment. I think by 2030, California should be the first state with some sort of guaranteed income policy or income tax credit that does, at least for people making 50K or below, at least for people making the state median and below as a starting point. This has been a very powerful day. This is not like any committee I have ever sat on as an elected official. It's not like any committee I had ever attended as an expert witness or just somebody in the audience. So thank you for coming. And with that, this meeting is adjourned. It really takes everybody to make change. Uh, there's an old saying that uh, there's nothing more powerful than a committed group of people aiming to change the world. 
I think that committed group of people needs to be about 40 million now in California. Um, not just the people falling through the cracks. If it was the people who are most impacted by bad policy decisions that could make this change, we'd already have these changes, right? And so it really does take everybody. Policy decisions will help them to get resources. They do have to go hand in hand and it will pay dividends. It is a good bet to support someone getting out of poverty through entrepreneurship to create jobs and to create generational wealth. It's a good bet. People want to work, but work needs to pay. That, that, that people deserve shelter and, and, and housing, and, and, and housing they can afford. That people deserve the right to work and collectively bargain for the wages and the conditions that reflect the dignity that they have as people. That people deserve the opportunity to start their own businesses and shouldn't face barriers um, that other folks don't face in terms of access to capital. That that people, it should be easy for people to get the benefits they're entitled to. <laughs> the benefits that are already signed into law where the money is appropriated. And that government has to get out the way and make it easy for people to draw down benefits that they pay for with their taxes anyway. Or not to take advantage of the system, but to chase the American dream. You're spending all your days and nights working. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and you're not doing easy jobs, you're doing hard jobs that take up all day, and not sometimes two or three jobs. And then you still gotta take care of your family, you gotta take some self-care. There's two ways I could tell my story, right? I could tell it the individualized, capitalistic way, which could maybe make a movie, right? Um, and, or I could be really honest about the things that I've had to come up against, and not just me, but like communities that have been oppressed are up against, and how hard it is to actually make it in, in our current society. I'm, I was not too different from the youth that I'm bringing to these spaces and look where I'm in now. And people was amazed from that, like, they just think I've just been this level-headed kid this whole time, but it took a lot of growth, a lot of, a lot of uh, fallbacks, setbacks that, that turned me into this person that I am today. Um, exceptionalism takes pressure off leaders and all of us to really upset the setup and to make policy changes because the system must be working fine if a couple of people made it. The story isn't about exceptional individuals. It's about the fact that if we invested in everyone like they were exceptional, then we could end poverty in California once and for all. I definitely do have hope that us pushing and pushing, eventually somebody is gonna get up there and be like, hey, you know what, I heard you talking like you, like you did. You are like, hey, I heard you speaking at this place and I want to speak to you now more. Well, eventually somebody will, will do that to somebody that eventually make it up there and change it for the rest of us. Um, Summer. And who is he? It's Rocky. Oh, wow, you're so smart.